Tuberculosis, or TB, is as old as man himself. In ancient times, it was known as phthisis, which means wasting away. It was first described by Hippocrates, a pulmonary infection manifesting itself as weight loss, a cough, and blood in the sputum, which gradually led to death. In the 16th century, Italian doctor Girolamo Fracastoro proposed the theory that the disease was transmitted by a microorganism, invisible to the naked eye. In 1818, French physician René Lenec invented the stethoscope. Auscultation with the stethoscope revolutionized diagnosis of tuberculosis, but it was still not known how it was spread or how to treat it. Cures in sanatoriums were fashionable. Fresh air, rest, and a balanced diet were used both to isolate patients and treat them. In 1882, German physician Robert Koch discovered the tuberculosis bacillus that bears his name. From then on, it was known that Cox bacillus is spread through the air. Nicknamed the White Plague in the 19th century, tuberculosis was a great romantic, carrying off Chekhov, Chopin, Kafka, and Schiller. During that century, it was improvements in living conditions and hygiene, not medical advances, that curbed the spread of the disease. It wasn't until the 20th century that the BCG vaccine was developed, and even more importantly, the first antibiotics capable of effectively treating the disease were discovered. Wealthy countries were finally able to forget the disease until the 1980s when it resurfaced along with the AIDS epidemic. People living with HIV have weakened immune systems and so are more susceptible to tuberculosis. Meanwhile, resistance to antibiotics is becoming increasingly common. Every year, tuberculosis kills 1.3 million people. Nine million fall ill, of which 500,000 with a multi-drug resistant form, meaning antibiotics are ineffective. And these numbers are probably underestimated. <laughs> Tuberculosis is a prominent member of the Killer Disease Club. Like many of its fellow members, its victims aren't spread evenly across the world. The 22 worst affected countries are mostly in Africa and Asia. India and China together account for over 45% of the world's tuberculosis cases. When we look at the prevalence of the disease, in other words, comparing the number of people who have TB in a given country to its total population, Cambodia and South Africa have the highest rates. In a sample of 100,000 people in Cambodia, 764 people have the disease, compared to 99 in China. The disease spreads faster in some regions of the world than others. Southern Africa is well in the lead, with Swaziland, South Africa, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe having the highest number of new cases in 2013. Why does it spread faster in these countries? The answer has just four letters. A, I, D, S. AIDS. Because tuberculosis is an opportunistic disease. It takes advantage of the frailty of people who are HIV positive to strike. In South Africa at the beginning of the 2000s, the HIV AIDS epidemic was hitting hard and TB cases skyrocketed. Another factor to take into account is drug-resistant TB. That is, cases that are hard to treat because the bacterium has adapted and become resistant to antibiotics. 
Eastern Europe and Central Asia have the most of what are called resistant patients. While 80% of non-resistant TB cases are now curable, over half of people with drug-resistant TB are incurable. It may be an ancient disease, but the threat of TB is still all too real. Co-infection with the AIDS virus and the spread of resistance make the need to find new ways of combating the disease all the more urgent. An estimated one-third of the world's population is currently infected with tuberculosis. This pandemic is caused by a tiny bacterium called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. But fortunately, it doesn't mean that the world has two billion people suffering from tuberculosis. In most cases, the bacterium is neutralized by the body. When someone with tuberculosis coughs, they expel tiny drops of saliva full of bacteria that can infect people nearby. The bacteria then continue their journey down the respiratory tract and into the lungs. That person is then infected with TB. The body detects the invasion and mobilizes its immune cells, including macrophages, whose job it is to neutralize the bacteria. If this process of neutralization works, the person will have latent tuberculosis. This means that they are infected with the bacterium, but are not actually ill. However, in 5% of cases, especially young children, the immune system loses the battle, and the bacteria multiply. Then the person becomes sick. Unfortunately, latent tuberculosis sometimes awakens. This can happen several months or even years later, especially in adults with weak immune systems, people who are HIV positive, who are undergoing chemotherapy. When somebody has a cough, has difficulty breathing, has suffered from chest pain for at least three weeks, has a fever, night sweats, and has lost a lot of weight, the doctor may well suspect pulmonary tuberculosis. There are other, more rare, types of tuberculosis. The bacteria may spread via the bloodstream or the lymphatic system to other parts of the body. The lymph nodes, joints, digestive system, central nervous system, the liver, or the heart, where they wreak havoc. The tools we currently use against tuberculosis are outdated. There are three diagnostic tests. They're old and don't work well. A skin test, a chest x-ray, and a laboratory examination of sputum from the bronchi. Each one has its drawbacks, imprecision, slowness, and difficulty. A new diagnostic test has been available since 2011. Results are available in two hours, and it can detect both tuberculosis and resistance to the main antibiotic. But we're still far from the ideal diagnostic test. For example, a, a rapid, reliable blood or urine test to be able to treat quickly, to interrupt transmission, and to save the patient. With regard to treatment, doctors have been using the same drugs for the last 50 years. Treatment for regular tuberculosis is long and difficult to follow, four antibiotics every day for six to nine months. And for patients with resistant tuberculosis, it's a nightmare. Two years of treatment with a cocktail of oral and injectable antibiotics with a range of difficult side effects. All this for a one in two chance of being cured. For the doctor, it's a real challenge to motivate patients to continue treatment.
I've been taking all these drugs for nearly seven years. I know them all by heart. And I know the side effects of each drug. Even now, I still have nausea and dizziness when I take the drugs. But now, it's manageable. I'm joyful now. I'm happy with my family, my children, my neighbors. Everyone should be part of their community. I'm young. I'm 60 years old. I'm still a useful part of my community. There is, however, hope on this bleak horizon. Clinical trials are ongoing for two new anti-tuberculosis medications, betaquiline and dilaminid. In 2015, they were prescribed to 2,600 patients with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis in 16 countries. These two new drugs bring hope for shorter, less toxic, and more effective treatment. <laughs> We're studying a worm, the planarium, or flatworm. It's an invertebrate. We became interested in this worm because it has a strong survival capacity. It's an immortal worm. You can cut it into little pieces and it regenerates. So we asked ourselves, if it has this high capacity to regenerate, does it also have any special immune responses or ways to combat pathogens? So we took the worm, fed it, infected it with disease-carrying bacteria, 16 different bacteria that cause human disease, including the mycobacteria tuberculosis, and we studied what it did with the bacteria. We noticed that, unlike humans or other organisms, it killed all the bacteria we tested, including mycobacteria tuberculosis. So we tried to understand the mechanism the worm used to resist these disease-carrying bacteria and to identify the mechanism in order to understand what happened in humans and why humans aren't able to fight bacteria such as Mycobacterium tuberculosis. We identified a series of genes that are involved in the worm's resistance to the disease-carrying bacteria. Among the genes we identified, one called MORN2 kills mycobacteria. Then we looked at human white blood cells to see if the same gene was there, because the worm can kill the bacteria, but humans can't. We saw that the gene is there, but it doesn't work fully when it encounters the bacteria. Then, we added the gene, in vitro, into human white cells, and we saw that the human white cells developed the capacity to kill mycobacterium tuberculosis. This has opened a new direction for potential treatments against tuberculosis, to get rid of, or more effectively, fight this bacteria that affects humans. Optimistically, it might be in 10 years, First, we have to go from the planaria worm to cell cultures. We've started. We know how to do it. Next, we have to go to a much bigger model. Maybe mice, or even rabbits, maybe primates. And finally, we'll get to humans. <laughs>